Thank you that very much, Dr. Torino. I see a uh, avid and scholarly audience. This is a memorable session, I'm sure. Um, my task is to tell you what I think are the ingredients of a perfect manuscript. Um, there's, a, there's, an old, there's an old saying in surgery that perfection is the enemy of the good person, but not when it comes to manuscripts. I thought I'd tell you a few, a couple of interesting observations. You see the cartoon on the left there is, I have a lot of really good ideas, but I just can't get them down on paper. And over here we said, I'm afraid you must decline the opportunity to publish your manuscript, how to get published at this time. Well, doctors and scientists are not measured by dexterity, knowledge, and certainly not by their charm but they are measured and become known or remain unknown by their publications or lack of publications. So this is pretty important. I'm going to emphasize two qualities that I think are important in the perfect manuscript. One is succinctness, how to say it in as few words as possible, and clarity, how to say it as clear as possible. Clarity, whatever you write has got to be crystal clear. State your facts as simply as possible. No one wants flowers of eloquence or literary and ornaments in a research or clinical outcomes article. And above all, I think this is the message that I would say to any author as he prepares his manuscript for any of the journals that you will hear about today. I'm going to dissect each portion of the uh, paper and tell you a little bit about this and make some observations that I think we hope will stick with you. First of all, the title of the paper. First impressions are strong impressions. A title should therefore provide a definite and concise indication of what is to come. In preparing the title, the author should take into consideration the title it will be read by thousands and many, many more that will actually read your paper. And I think that's a very important note. The authors should have a title, which may often be a question, but it should be provocative, and it should be stimulating. The fewest possible words that describe the contents of the paper is considered a good title. Order of the authors. Another important aspect that sometimes gets extremely political. O'Connor said, if you have co-authors, problems about authorship can range from the trivial to the catastrophic. When you leave somebody off a paper, for example. And Gay said, the easiest part of a scientific paper is simply entering the bylines, the authors and addresses, sometimes. Now, we all know that you should only have people on the paper who contribute to the paper. And that's very, very important. Non-contributing authors should not be on the paper and it should be documented what that author has contributed to the paper. A conflict sometimes comes up when you have prospective randomized trials which involves sometimes even a hundred different authors. These are best done by organizing the managing group of the prospective randomized trial, and those be the authors, and then all others who contribute, which again may be hundreds, should be in an appendix at the end of the article. The abstract. An abstract is a mini version of the paper and should provide a brief, clear summary of the main sections of the paper. An abstract can be defined as a summary of the information in the document. It is not a place to pontificate. It is not a place to ph philosophize. It's a place to summarize very succinctly. And the introduction of the paper. <clears throat> Euripides, the great Greek philosopher, said, a bad beginning makes a bad ending. The first section of the text 
is an introduction. The purpose is to supply sufficient background information to allow the reader to understand and evaluate the questions to be answered and the outline of the data or outline of the procedure that the investigators have gone through to answer the question and nothing more. No philosophy and no politics. The next section is materials and methods. Whitehead said, the greatest invention of the 19th century was the invention of the method of invention. In the materials and methods section, you give the full details of your experiment or of your outcomes research or your technical paper. The main purpose of this section is to describe and at times defend the clinical or laboratory experimental design and provide enough detail so that a competent worker or observer in your same field can theoretically repeat those experiments or those observations. Now the key element of any paper, experimental outcomes research or series of retrospective observations are the results. Thomas Edison, the greatest, one of the greatest inventor in, Ameri in the history of the world, who invented the light bulb, among other things, said, results. Well, man, I have gotten a lot of results. I know several thousand things that won't work. Thomas Edison. This should be well organized, perhaps in charts or graphs that need not be repeated in detail in the text. I think sometimes authors give the results in the text which are actually repeated in the charts for the sakes of clarity and the sake of referral to the most complete set of data, it is often enough to say the results are summarized in table, etc. And I think that's a very important thing that articles not get so verbose by repeating both the results in the text and the results in tables that are in graphs that are presented. It should be, this is the most important section, have total clarity, which includes your statistical methods as well, which has become an increasingly important aspect of publishing today. Statistical methods should be defined as well in the method section. The discussion. This is the hardest part of a paper. A Kenyan moderate proverb said, having a good discussion is like having riches. The discussion is harder to define than the other sections and is usually the hardest section to write. Many manuscripts get rejected because of poor, rambling, non-focused, unclear discussions. A good discussion should admit the limitations of the article, of the methods that the author has presented, and should emphasize the salient arguments, the data, and the rationale for the conclusions that he or she makes. References of a paper. My friend uh, William Roberts, who is the editor, the longtime editor of the American Journal of Cardiology, said this statement. Manuscripts containing innumerable references are more likely a sign of insecurity than a mark of scholarship. References can be important, but they can also be very space-wasting in this particular period of time when uh, space is at a premium in many journals. You should only list significant published references. And secondly, and most importantly, Check all the parts of every reference against the original publication before the manuscript is submitted, and perhaps even again at the time of the <coughs> when you receive the proofs. Tables. We talked about this a little. A table is a tabular presentation of data at the heart, or better, the brain of a scientific paper. And the charts and the graphs may be the one of the few things that somebody will read and take from your particular paper. As a rule, do not construct a table unless a repetitive data must be presented. As I said also before, do not repeat the data in the text necessarily. 
There are two reasons. First, it is not good science to regurgitate reams of data just because you have them, and secondly, they are more expensive to reproduce. <coughs> Figures. Susan Sontag, the great photographer, said, Life is not about significant details, illuminating and flash, but photographs are. And one important factor is the value of the figures you are presenting. This can range from zero, in which case they should not be submitted at all, to a value that transcends that of the text itself. For example, studies of cell ultrastructure, if that's what your paper is about. The significance of the paper will obviously lie in the photograph and figures that you reproduce. <coughs> Proofs. And they come back to you for your analysis and your uh, perusal before the paper is published. Proof very carefully to see if you any... Oh, I'm sorry, there's a loud word left out there. <laughs> That's a joke. Um... James Mishner, who wrote South Pacific, said, I'm not a very good writer, but I'm an excellent rewriter. This is difficult these days to rewrite a paper in the proof section. It can be done, but it will obviously uh, shorten, or I should say lengthen, your time from which the article gets, uh, gets written. Conflict of interest is going to be addressed by my colleague, Dr. Wexler. I just want to say only one word about it, so that this makes a perfect manuscript, and that is the word transparency. He will give you chapter and verse on this. There's an old saying, if you're not conflicted, you're not an expert. I don't necessarily believe that, but uh, people do say that. But just make it totally transparent, and that's all you have to do, and there should be no further discussion. Now, this is the conclusion of the paper. There are many types of papers that are written and submitted in today's vastly complex scientific literature, but the major qualities of every paper should be succinctness. Try to say it as briefly and as clearly as possible, but above all, accuracy in your data, accuracy in your statistical review, and accuracy in your references should be paramount to getting the perfect manuscript. The last couple of quotes, there's no danger in being too precise, only in being imprecise. And the cardinal sin in medical writing is not grammatical error, but obscurity, not allowing yourself to uh, make it in the clearest and most succinct possible way. I will give credit that I read this book in preparation for this particular presentation, Robert Day, How to Write and Publish a Scientific Paper. Mr. Chairman, that is my rules for a perfect manuscript. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Larry, for this succinct presentation. And uh, we will just continue with the counter.